it's a few minutes after the hour. So good morning, everybody. I appreciate you for joining us this morning and uh, happy Juneteenth. I'm Martin Rosendale. I'm the CEO of the Maryland Technology Council and a partner with Newport. This is the live Capital M Zoomcast. The Capital M podcast is intended to further the regional conversation around capital markets, define issues, identify solutions, and build consensus to drive change. Recently, we've pivoted to a live Zoomcast, and our focus these days has been on the COVID-19 pandemic, the regional response, and our recovery. I'd like to take just a minute and thank our sponsor this morning, the University of Maryland Biopark. The Biopark is Baltimore's largest biotech cluster and is home to leading and early stage life sciences companies. It accelerates biotech commercialization and economic development in West Baltimore and throughout the region. The Biopark has been a longtime supporter of the Maryland Technology Council, and I can tell you that great things are happening at the Biopark. So if you're not familiar with it, I recommend that you go on the internet, take a look, and see all the wonderful things that are happening there. The Maryland Technology Council is the industry trade association that represents technology and life science companies throughout the state. <clears throat> We're improving the business climate in Maryland and helping companies that save, secure, and improve lives around the globe. Before we get started this morning, I just want to take a minute uh, with a few housekeeping items. Your microphones are on mute right now. Uh, they will stay on mute um, during the, the discussion portion of, of our time this morning. And when we get to the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to raise your hand and we'll be able to take your microphone off mute so you can ask questions. In the meantime, if you use the Q&A function that should be at the bottom of your screen, I will be monitoring it through the discussion and I'll be able to weave some of those, those questions um, into this discussion as we go. So, um, so please uh, use the Q&A function. Uh, the chat function should also be on as well. Um, just so you know, this, this will be recorded as well as the, the chat content will also be recorded for future playback for others that want to uh, listen in or watch the Zoomcast. So thank you all for joining us this morning. My guest today is Dave Hickey. Dave is the worldwide president of Integrated Diagnostic Solutions for Beckton Dickinson. He's a member of the Johns Hopkins Health Advisory Board and more recently an advisor to the president's COVID-19 task force. Dave, you've been a busy man. Thank you for joining yeah, me this morning. Absolutely, Marty. Looking forward to it. Great. So Dave, you spent more than 20 years in the in vitro diagnostics industry. Could you just take a minute, tell us about yourself, and, and tell us why you do what you do? So, Marty, thank you very much. And again, just a, a pleasure to be, uh, uh, you know, with, with the Tech Council today. Um, so, I'm here based in Baltimore. Um, you know, I've been with Beckton Dickinson now for just over six years. I, I think you'll tell from my accent that I am not a native Baltimorean. Uh, actually, my career started... Uh, many, many years ago in the UK NHS. So from a graduate perspective, um, my, my career is in clinical biochemistry and I, I worked in the UK NHS for just over six years, uh, but then joined industry um, primarily for just over 20 years with, uh, with Siemens Healthcare. Uh, and then, as I say, six years ago, I moved to BD, um, uh, also to now lead and run the global infectious disease business. Uh, so, you know, for me, I, I would say healthcare, um, you know, I'm a very purpose driven individual and, and, and executive, you know, uh, even from BD's perspective, uh, where our purpose is advancing the world of health, I would say wanting to take a role, be in a role, be in a leadership position, where from the start of my career right up until today, it's always been pathology and it's always been healthcare. So, uh, you know, the purpose of just delivering healthcare solutions is is what me, you know, gets me out of bed every day. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the, the Beckton Dickinson operation that, that's here in Maryland. Yeah, so um, starting just at the higher level, so BD is around 65,000 associates worldwide, and we have nine sort of very dedicated healthcare businesses. Specifically here in Maryland and Baltimore, we are an associate base of... Uh, close to 2,000 people right now. Um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, I look at the, you know, as I say, we're primarily an infectious disease. Um, and, you know, when I started with the company just over six years ago, our associate base was closer to 1650, 1700 here. Um, you know, based on our growth, we've had the tremendous privilege to be adding jobs here in the Maryland, Baltimore area. And 
we're close to 2,000 people and you know actually here in you know our main campuses are up in the Hunts Valley Sparks area uh, of, of Baltimore and uh, we have a whole range of operations from R&D um, so the innovation side of our business manufacturing operations distribution supply chain um, as well as obviously the administrative side of, of the business so it is the it's the global headquarters for integrated diagnostics mm -hmm. so so dave the entire country the world in fact has been dealing with this public health emergency and and i'm curious you know when the executive orders came down in march to close non-essential businesses and employees that could work from home should work from home with 2,000 employees and such a, a critical business to keep going, how did Beck and Dickinson respond to those executive orders? No, it's a great question. Um, and honestly, it was really, um, we had to be very targeted and selective. So, you know, if I, if I think about the, and, and obviously, you know, we were driven by wanting to do what's right from a continued operation so that we could keep the diagnostic supply chain moving. Um, we also wanted to be very conscious of the safety and, and the environment of, of, of all of our associates in, you know, in, in, in our Maryland facilities. So, you know, we immediately sort of started to follow both corporate policy as well as the local state policy as, as Governor Hogan and, and team rolled things out. <clears throat> so, you know, many of us, um, you know, immediately started to work from home. So what I would say is if, if our roles allowed it right from the executive leadership all the way down to the marketeers, the business, uh, even our US sort of commercial organization, we immediately implemented a work from home policy. But then we also looked around, you know, what was our role here in terms of um, still trying to serve the nation, the globe, the community with the right diagnostic products. So we, we implemented an essential worker category um, and typically those essential workers would have been our manufacturing operations, distribution, uh, elements of our, our, our R&D team that were critical to working on sort of some of this rapid COVID innovation. And, and maybe we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, but, you know, there was obviously processes that were put in place by the FDA and the agency around the, this um, ability for emergency use authorization to get rapid innovation to market. So, you know, we really, we really sort of looked at our associate base and said, who can legitimately and safely do their role from home? But who is it that we have to classify as an essential worker? What we did for those individuals, obviously, was we made all the right PPE available. Um, we implemented safety guidelines, social distancing guidelines for the facilities. We put sort of temperature screening monitors on sort of uh, access points to each of our facility. And then they all um, actually, right at the beginning of the pandemic, we actually gave them a letter that they would carry with them. So in case they were just stopped by police or if they were on the road, they had sort of authorization, sort of evidence that they were, they were doing a, a very, very critical role. Mm -hmm. That's great. You know, a, a lot of the biotechnology companies in the state um, took similar actions. And, um, yeah. and initially when the exec executive order came out, uh, biotechnology was accidentally left off as, a, as an essential business, um, but we, we managed to get that changed in an amendment and then um, helped companies draft those letters. So yeah. I'm gonna bring up, I wanna bring up a slide on the screen here. Dave, when you and I met, it was because the, the pandemic had hit and there were challenges in the supply chain uh, I was uh, part of a small group that was looking for uh, testing capacity throughout the state, and uh, and I gave you a call. First of all, I want to thank you because you were amazingly responsive and and helpful in that discussion. Um, but I wonder if you could take a minute and, and talk about those early challenges to the supply chain, and and, and how Beckton Dickinson responded because you did some amazing things. Yeah. So thank you, Marty, and 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 and, and obviously. Just being so local in the area, I'm, I'm glad we could help, you know, you and your colleagues out from a, t a tech council perspective. It was, it was just the right thing to do. And, but, you know, just to maybe orient the, the audience to the slide here. So, you know, it was interesting when we look back, as I, as I said in my opening remarks, you know, we're, we're primarily a, an infectious disease uh, company. So there were elements of our portfolio 
that we already had, we were already manufacturing, we already had in inventory, you know, that, 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 that are just used every day for routine infectious disease testing. You know, and if, if you look at the left of the slide where you're looking at swabs and collection, you know, so when people have an infection and you have to collect a swab and send it off to the lab, you know, um, we had those sorts of, um, th those materials. The instrument off to the right is, is an instrument that we call the BD Max. Um, you know, that is actually manufactured up in our, in our Sparks, Maryland campus. And that was already running a series of molecular based um, infectious disease tests. The platform in the middle, what you see is the BD Veritor, they're a very, very tiny battery operated point of care device. We, uh, we have 28,000 of those instruments in the United States. And today that's used for uh, flu A and flu B testing. So we, we already knew that we had elements of the portfolio that were relevant, but we also knew that there were areas of innovation that we wanted to do to expand the role of, of, of our platforms. Um, so what I would say is if you look at the slide as a whole, the, the workflow that you've got here is obviously the collection devices on the right. So when patients turn up at a hotspot or a collection center or a drive-through, you know, how do they get their sample collected? One of the things we wanted to do, and as you read the press, the middle piece, the serology test, is there were two schools of thought as the pandemic hit uh, that demanded diagnostic solutions or answers. One was serology tests, and serology is more a test of if you've been exposed to the disease or if you've had the disease, have I raised antibodies against coronavirus so that you know I'm building some level of immunity? And that will become critical as, pa as part of um, the, the, I've just lost the slide, Marty. Yeah, I'm I'll, sorry. I'll, I, I made a mistake there. That's okay. I'll keep talking. But on the serology, you know, that is going to be a critical part of the sort of return to work, screening, et cetera, et cetera, because people will want to know, um, have, I, have I had or been exposed to the disease? And then the, the more the molecular platform, so this BD Max on the right here is a, a very direct molecular test, highly sensitive test to see whether... Um, somebody has the active uh, has the disease versus had it and then this point of care one we actually have a test in development right now um you know that, that we are hoping to commercialize very soon which would be effectively a much smaller version of the molecular test but that could be rapidly deployed across these twenty-eight thousand flu-based platforms that we have so you know there was a whole innovation story here uh, and then to your specific question on supply chain, I'll, I'll give you, I'll try and give you some numbers. Um, so for the swabs and collection devices, um, even in a very high flu season, we would typically do about 600,000 units a year of, of swabs. Right now, we're doing about 3 million devices a week. So, you know, so the, the demand for just collection to support the testing is huge. And then on the right hand side, even to make this instrument, as I say, which is made here in Baltimore, we would typically just normally make about six or seven of those instruments a week. We have ramped up capacity, invested capital, so that we're now making close to 15, 16 a week. Um, so really, you know, you know, two point something times our normal capacity. Um, and our goal for this, uh, for the point of care antigen test, Again, flu, we would normally do uh, maybe a, a total of 11 to 12 million tests a year for the flu type test in a high flu season. We've, we've, we have invested capital and infrastructure to be able to make 10 million tests per month. Um, and the administration is still saying that may not be enough. So it just, you know, so getting the innovation portfolio was right and then building scale infrastructure and capital to meet the demand was the, was the second challenge. So, so Dave, those are some amazing numbers. Now, you know, we didn't, here, here in the U.S., <clears throat> we didn't get the, the, the genetic, genetic sequence of the virus until about mid-January. And you're responsible for a worldwide organization. Um, from a leadership perspective, 
how do you pivot so quickly? How do you go from not having any activity in this in, in this space with respect to COVID-19 and, and pivot so quickly and, and start producing those kinds of numbers? I mean, it's, it's only been less than six months now. Yeah. So, I mean, actually, um, so, you know, again, it's, it's really a case by case situation. Um, so, you know, some of the natural things that you might expect a, a company with a, with a large manufacturing base to do is, you know, if we were now, of course, we, we, we had to focus very quickly and rapidly on securing all the raw material. So, you know, the, 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 the partners that we have and the raw material providers and the critical raw materials, you know, we work with our partners in that field to place uh, incremental quantity orders, secure supply chain, make sure the lead times were okay. Um, you know, if we were in normal production mode, which, you know, for illustrative purposes may have been nine to five, Monday to Friday or nine till nine, sometimes in some of our facilities, you know, we would have to really think about um, shift based systems. So, you know, for certainly in some of our facilities, we have now gone 24 seven um, with a three shift system just to keep the demand up. I will tell you, so that's more on the supply side. Um, a lot of this was also, you know, really due to the credit of the administration um, and also the, the regulatory authorities like the FDA. So for example, you know, if you think about when you're making these diagnostic tests, you know, normally depending upon the type of test, you're either subject to having to do, you know, lengthy clinical trials, submit a 510K, uh, submit a PMA or a pre-market approval, you know, but then the FDA, for example, um, introduced something called the emergency use authorization, uh, EUA, which they typically tend to do in sort of pandemic uh, crisis is they've done it before with Ebola, they've done it before with Zika, um, you know, and what they basically say, it say is, you still need to prove clinical effectiveness. You still need to prove through some validation studies that the quality of the diagnostic test is fit for use, but they'll require a much less uh, ro robust data set. So you've still got to validate that and you've still got to do some element of clinical performance. But what it would also mean is, you know, for a test that would typically take you know, maybe 18 months to two years to develop and then maybe a six month clinical trial. So think about it in a two and a half to three year window. We've been able to sort of innovate these assays because you, we still had the base architecture, you know, the fundamental architecture for these diagnostics. It's just how do you sort of modify it or alter it to, to, to detect coronavirus rather than the influenza virus. So we were fortunate that the base was there. But, you know, we were, we were from start to finish, we were developing and getting EUA approval with the FDA in three months or less. So, a trim, but it, it was a tremendous lift by our R&D team and the supporting functions of quality and regulatory. And then where the administration were hugely helpful, if you look at the swab devices on the, on the left-hand side, um, you know, and actually we have a partner in Italy that OEM manufactures this for us. You know, again, you know, normally they would ship in either via air freight or ocean freight into the port of Baltimore. The administration put on military air bridges. So when they recognized that we needed to be getting two to three million devices a week into our supply chain, they would literally put on a couple of C uh, C-70s, fly military aircraft to Italy, pick these things up via an air bridge, which is still in place today. And then they would bring it to the staging post um in tennessee uh, and then we would distribute from there so i think a lot of help support flexibility from the administration and the agency was also very critical here yeah that's amazing i, I mean we've seen tremendous collaboration and cooperation from from the fda and government agencies i i didn't realize that the military was getting involved with the with the distribution and the supply chain um, yep. with, with respect at least to, as the way you described it absolutely um, so so i think that's that's phenomenal <clears throat> so i'm gonna stop sharing this slide yep. but um so so looking forward so you've responded to COVID 19 you've you've 
pivoted the company to a great extent. You're manufacturing tremendous quantities of, of these testing supplies. Mm -hmm. What are you doing now looking forward? Are you, are you in the mode that you start, you're starting to look to the future now? Um, or where are things headed? Yeah, no, we, abs we absolutely are. So, I mean, obviously for us, you know, the first thing that we're still really focused on is, is making sure that we can secure supply. Um, because honestly, right now it's, uh, you know, trying to anticipate the demand generation um, for just how much testing is going to be done. Um, it, it's really, um, it's very difficult. You know, when even if you listen to the White House Diagnostic Task Force and you look at when they were doing their briefings, with Dr. Anthony Fauci and, and uh, Debbie Burks and, and Admiral Girard, um, and that was the interface that we've been very fortunate to have as, as part of BD, is you, you see demand estimates for testing between 5 million to 24 million tests per month. And I think that will have peaks and troughs depending upon how, how the, the nation continues to think about you know, the, the return to work, return to school, return to university strategy. So making sure that we've still got the agility in our supply chain to be able to do that is, is, is going to be really key. Um, and then honestly, we are turning ourselves right now to the upcoming flu season. So, you know, as I say, we, we've focused a lot of our efforts over the past three to four months on getting the coronavirus innovation in, into the healthcare system. You know, we're not that far from the flu season, you know, and then, you know, for those on, on the call that are familiar, you know, we start to get into an environment where we have what we would call influenza-like illnesses, ILI, and the CDC track ILI data uh, every week. And there's already guidance that would say, as we get into the flu season, if anybody presents with an influenza-like illness, you should do both a flu and a coronavirus or a COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 test. So again, we're very fortunate that we've built a technology base where we can actually on that BD Max platform that I showed you, we can, we can sort of run a flu and a coronavirus test together. And then on the point of care Veritor platform that I showed you that is already doing flu, our innovation goal there is to be able to combine the coronavirus test and the flu test onto the same diagnostic strip. So if one patient presents with ILI, they can have a swab taken, which is the normal standard of care. It can go into that machine and then the machine will tell them, is it flu or is it coronavirus? So it will be, uh, it will be an innovation pivot, you know, and, and the teams in, in Baltimore, uh, and we have R&D teams in San Diego as well, are starting to think about, right, what is it we now need to do between the end of June and really we think about September, October, obviously continuing to work with the agency, leveraging this emergency use uh, uh, authorization pathway to make sure that we've then got the right innovations in our supply chain uh, as we approach the flu season. <clears throat> That's great. So, so, so you've, gone, you've gone through a lot. Um, are there any specific lessons learned in, in coming into this, things that we could have done better, should have done better? Yeah, no, definitely. Um, I, you know, and, and I think to me, uh, you know, because obviously we're, we're, we're all collectively doing this response in, in, as it relates to coronavirus. But, you know, even at the, even at the highest level, it's happened before. You know, so if you, you know, this pandemic situation has been there before. If you think of Zika, Ebola, you know, H1N1 bird flu. So, so there's definitely a lens that we have that, that would say, you know, the next pandemic is when, not if. Um, so, you know, so, you know, so how do you prepare for, as a leader, you know, how do, and, and with your team, how do you pre prepare for that? And, you know, for us, even as we've gone through this coronavirus, you know, there are, there are sort of values and, and, and behavioral lessons, right? So I, I think about agility, I think about risk-based, I think about partnerships. Um, you know, I talked about the serology test on one of the prior slides, and, you know, that test is actually uh, developed by a company called Biomedomics. And again, we're currently working through the FDA procedure to, to introduce that. 
and then we will be the sort of you know the distribution sales marketing partner um you know to bring scale to this small company you know and then we also we also will be having a distribution partner today that is with Henry Shine for example one of the big healthcare and dental distributors in in the United States um, and when we sensed there was this need to do serology for example uh, and get this serology test into the United States get it reviewed by the FDA get it into our supply chain more importantly get it into our customers we did that sort of transaction of a three-way business development deal, so to speak, in about 11 days. We had the right executives on the phone. You know, we would be on calls until decisions were made. And, you know, for all of us that are business leaders, you know that these contract negotiations, they can take six, seven, 10 months. So I think, you know, there, there, are, there are elements of behavior that I think we should absolutely look to learn from and anchor into our process. Uh, I think equally the, the same would be true of the somebody like the FDA and the agency, um, because obviously and rightly so, the safety and efficacy of any device is the most important thing that they and we as manufacturers have to think about. But right now, you know, they, they put this emergency use authorization in place. They're scrutinizing multiple, multiple innovations that are out in the field right now being used for diagnostic insight. Uh, and to the best of, that all of us know, without harm. And they're fit for purpose and physicians are making clinical decisions. So I think not only does industry, but I think government and agency need to sort of, you know, I think also take a step back and look at this and say, should we, you know, could, could the EUA be more, uh, be more of the norm going forward? Yeah, no, I think that, that that's fantastic. You know, this this collaboration and this response from from the FDA and, go, and government agencies. I I agree with you. I'm watching the FDA. They have managed, you know, just like industry, to to pivot quickly and to respond, and to and to do their job, which is to protect the public, right? But but at the same time, be very be very fast and respond to the need, which which is phenomenal. So I, I agree with you to the extent that we can maintain that and keep that going um, would be fantastic. Exactly. Dave, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring up another slide. So, you know, as, as we look back on this, um, there are going to be many, many heroes to celebrate. Everyone from the, the healthcare workers and the hospitals and the clinics, the grocery store clerks that have made sure that we've had food while we've been locked down, um, what you've described is just amazing activity at Beckton Dickinson, and, and and I want to give you an opportunity to talk about the heroes on on your team, and and how they've responded and and stepped up to this challenge. Uh, I, and honestly, Matty, probably the most important slide of, of of the two that have you know that I've been able to show. Um, you know, and and honestly, if I if I if I could name them all, I, I absolutely would. I, you know, but but you know, I'll come to BD in a second, right? But but I, I think to your point, you know, it's um, I think anybody that has touched and 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 had impact and and had some level of personal response engagement into this crisis uh, is, is by definition a hero. Um, you know, and you mentioned some of the industry and some, and some of the functions and the workers already. Um, you know, for BD particularly, and, and again, this is BD as a whole, you know, because obviously I'm, you know, I've got the privilege of talking to you about our role as integrated diagnostic solutions, you know, but for the broader BD, you know, we obviously make, you know, one of our businesses on medication management. So you think about, you know, uh, the people that were unfortunately or are unfortunately in intensive care on pumps and syringes and drips. You know, that's another critical piece of, of our supply chain and our portfolio. We have one group that is focused on uh, pharmaceutical, we call it farm systems, pharmaceutical systems. They're heavily engaged right now, making billions of devices to support the vaccine. Um, you know, so, so at the broadest BD level, there are so many people. Here, what you see specifically is are our Baltimore associates. Um, and actually, you know, it's funny, I, I, I've been working from home literally for four months. I, you know, I tried to lead by example. And, and so I literally have been doing all my tasks from home with the exception of today. 
today is actually my first day in the office and I'm actually in the building in the facility right in that bottom middle picture uh, with one of our associates holding the banner. Um, and I've come actually to, to, to recognize our associates specifically because it's Juneteenth. Um, and I wanted to spend some time with our, our, our manufacturing team here. Um, but you know, these are the individuals, whether they are developing stuff, innovating COVID solutions, you see in, in the top right, manufacturing, operations, supply chain, they're the people that are truly making it happen. And, you know, the bottom left here is actually uh, one of our own car parks uh, up, in, uh, up in Sparks on Lufton Circle, where in order for us to do these validation studies that I talked about as part of our uh, molecular testing, we have to collect swabs, you know, to, to, to sort of uh, do the clinical testing. You know, and these are our, our own associates that will sign up to be a volunteer uh, donator of samples, so to speak. And we actually set up our own drive through car park where we had healthcare professionals in the blue and white coats, gowns, would literally be taking swabs from our associates so that we could collect the right number of specimens uh, to do the clinical testing to submit to the FDA to get into supply chain. Um, and one of the things that we wanted to do was just recognize their extraordinary efforts. And, you know, uh, Mila one, and, and others, one of our great communications uh, professionals, came up with this idea to do these banners of, you know, heroes work here. So, you know, what's interesting is, you know, outside of every BD facility now that is, co you know, contributing to the COVID pandemic and solutions around the COVID crisis, there are these banners. Uh, you know, I, it's funny, I drive by it nearly, you know, every time I'm on the road, but right on Route 83, right up by Shawan, Shawan Road, which is the facility I'm in now, there's a manufacturing tower, there's a huge banner at the top of that. Uh, individuals not even connected with BD are taking pictures of that banner, putting it on social me media, Facebook, Twitter. So not only the recognition that BD has done, but the recognition that just you know, the members of the public and the community are giving is just fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah, that, that, that's great. I agree. I agree. It's, it's fantastic. I mean, what, what, what your team has done and what you've described this morning with, the, with respect to the, the pivot to address the response to COVID-19, the, uh, the phenomenal things that, that you've accomplished, the fact that you, you know, your team just is staying focused and making these things happen, absolutely they're they're clearly among the heroes of this COVID-19 pandemic so it's thank great you. greatly greatly appreciated thank you so you know we're we're probably you know somewhere just past the middle of this public health emergency and you know, I, I know on the business side we're looking at uh, co companies you know what the recovery is going to look like we're beginning to plan for the future we're we're talking about things like uh, resilience exercises to to you know, test you know how resilient we are and our businesses are. Um, I would be remiss, Dave, if I didn't ask you to get your crystal ball out. Um, you are an advisor to to the president and the and the COVID nineteen task force. Do you you know what what do you see? Are we prepared for the next pandemic? Are we prepared for the, the second surge if there is one with with COVID nineteen? Oh, that's a great question, um, and, and I would say. Um, in pockets. I, I mean, I still think there is work, there is definitely still work to do. Um, you know, and, and I think a lot of it, you know, you talk in one of your earlier questions, Marty, about, you know, the lessons learned. I, you know, I think there are things that we just have to do at risk here, um, you know, because, you know, for us as business leaders and who have to innovate and manufacture and distribute, um, you just don't know what the demand is going to be. So, you know, what I would say is I will, you know, for many of our, much of our portfolio today, we are still in what we call an allocation methodology. So, you know, we are making as much as we can make, um, you know, with the capital and the infrastructure and the associates we have, even working 24-7. Um, but there are still, you know, elements of our portfolio where the demand is, out, is outstripping supply. So, you know, we have our business teams that are working on allocation uh, and that's just to meet to today's demand. Now, you know, we, we, uh, we try to be fair and equitable in our allocation methodology. We follow the hotspots. We try and follow the curves. 
we put a lot of capital investment in, but of course, as, as, as you and many of your audience will know, to put automation in to increase capacity to validate that automation so that it delivers quality product can often have three, four, six month lead times. So I, I, I think I would say certainly from BD's perspective, we're using the lessons learned We've, you know, we've been doing some demand modeling and that demand modeling is informing and influencing our investment decisions, our prioritization decisions for supply chain and capacity. Um, you know, and then it just becomes a timing issue. You know, if there is a second, and, and I would say probably the default assumption that we've been looking to make is we think we're doing a really, really good job to get through June, July, August. You know, I think there's an assumption that maybe there would then be a low September, October, and most of our investment capacity, capital, we're really trying to bring online for the flu season because you there is a huge assumption that this has got a a, a seasonal pattern to it. Um, so I, I I would say you know if the demand stayed high all the way through the calendar of the year, many of us, men, much of the in vitro diagnostics industry will be on allocation um, until this new capital comes up. Interesting. So, so Dave, there are a number of small to mid-sized diagnostics companies have, have pivoted and responded to the COVID-19 pandemic as well. And you're talking about further innovation in, in development. Does Beck and Dickinson ever collaborate with, with smaller companies? We absolutely we do, um, and again I think it's um, I would say it's situational. So you know, and, and I'll, but I'll try and give you a couple of examples. So you know, even just with um, production, you know, I mean, so again, we're a huge company. We're making millions of devices a week, but even for those um, antigen tests that I talked to you about, all the molecular diagnostic tests. It starts with what we call critical raw material. Uh, and those critical raw materials could be one gram, two grams, five grams of a protein that you then scale up and put into all these diagnostic devices. So there are elements of um, you know, partnership there where there are companies that are critical to your own success that, that, you know, that we really, really try and partner with versus transaction. Um, from that perspective, the serology company that I referenced, you know, small company headquartered in, in North Carolina, um, you know, are making this serology test. But what they don't do is they didn't have any capability or capacity to, to drive scale and reach and channel. So both through ourselves and with a distribution partner, Henry Shine, we partner in that way. Uh, much closer to home, you know, I, I think about the role of the tech council and, you know, the emails that I would get from Michelle, for example, mm -hmm. you know, we're around companies that are either looking for something or have something available. You know, I know when we started, when we first started the pandemic um, and, you know, we were running into shortage of PPE and things like that because there was such a surge for demand, you know, we would look across that network. I would take those emails send them to my heads of R&D, send them to my heads of operation uh, in the hope that there could be some network created there for what we would see as a critical need, but that was potentially a supply from somebody else that would keep somebody else's business whole as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. So, so Dave, we have a couple of questions in the queue already, but before we get into the Q&A, um, l let me ask you, is there, is there anything that we haven't covered this morning that you you would like to talk about? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think honestly, Maria, I think the questions have been excellent. Uh, looking forward to seeing what the audience have, have got. I, I mean, the only I mentioned it a little bit. You know, I, I think the only thing that I would say now is a, a lot of our attention um, as a leadership team for the business and for the company is starting to look at the the our role as industry in this whole return to work. Uh, algorithm. You know, just a few weeks ago, the administration uh, released what they called the testing blueprint uh, for America. Um, you know, because again, when you look at, you know, I had, I had one associate yesterday that asked me if he could, if he could go offline for a couple of hours to attend his, 
his son's remote virtual graduation. You know, it, we're all living in a, 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 a crazy ecosystem right now. And, um, you know, so I, I'll tell you that, you know, I think how we think about this concept of testing, the testing blueprint, testing for America to get industry, the norm of industry, school, society, all our workers back to work and the role of diagnostic testing in that and particularly serology, how those tests are reimbursed, are they proactively screened? You know, that's a debate that we're heavily involved in right now, just in order to get society moving again. Thank you. All right, so I want to remind um, everybody who's watching this morning that uh, there, there will be two options for asking questions. One, if you, if you want to type your question into the Q&A, um, then we can re review the questions in that fashion. Or um, the other option is to raise your hand and uh, there, should be, there should be a hand icon at the bottom of your screen that would allow you to raise your hand and then we can unmute your microphone and let you ask your question personally. So, so Dave, the first question is actually a pretty specific question around the point of care antigen testing itself. The question is, how much time does that, does that take to, to run that test? And, it, and is, it, is it also PCR based? Is it, is it antibody? Does it use antibody or is it also yeah. PCR based? Yeah, great, great question. Um, so the test itself will be 15 minutes. Um, and you know, what we've, what we've also tried to do is, um, when you normally think about the flu test, the flu test actually uses, um, what we call a nasal pharyngeal swab. So that's the swab that goes right back up to the back of the nasal pharynx. Um, and that was one of the challenges is, is that, you know, there was huge demand for those swabs. So a couple of things is it will be 15 minutes. Um, uh, it will use a swab. But in our studies, we're also trying to validate just a regular nasal swab that would normally go into the nasal cavity. Because I think if we can, if we can prove the clinical validation using a regular nasal swab, it would support this concept of um, millions of devices a week, which, which doesn't then prevent any supply chain challenges. Um, it is not a PCR test. So even though it is a direct measure of the antigen itself, it uses what we call a technology around lateral flow immunoassay. So again, very similar to, to, to the way the flu technologies work. Um, you know, and for those that are not maybe as necessarily close to the science, you know, a, a good analogy here is like, if you think about a pregnancy test. So it's a type of strip, a lateral flow strip. You put the sample, the antibody to the antigen is on, is on the strip. You put the sample on the, on the strip. You wait 15 minutes and then you would put the strip and the, the if positive, it would give a band. You put the, um, you know, you put that strip into the, into the instrument and that instrument, the Veritor will detect the presence of a band or not. Great. Question. Great. Thank you. There's actually a, a follow on question. Um, could, could you also talk a little bit about the sensitivity and specificity of the test? Yeah, so for sure. So of course, um, given the fact that it is a lateral flow immunoassay, the FDA and not PCR, I mean, obviously for PCR lab-based methods that take many more, you know, many hours to run, our, our own BD Max test is around three hours, just under three hours. You would, you know, were there, you would expect, because it is molecular, a very high, 100%, or at least greater than 99.5% specificity sensitivity, here the guidelines are a little bit uh, looser so the you know what the fda have said here for for these lateral flow based tests is that you need to meet still a very high specificity bar but the sensitivity required is 80 percent so usually so we so the the hurdle we're trying to cross is is people that are symptomatic this would not have um you know we don't see an application for this technology asymptomatically uh, that's maybe where, where the PCR test would come in um, but we're sort of looking at patients that have got you know are within x days of demonstrated symptom onset uh, but we're looking to meet the FDA minimum FDA requirement of 80 percent. Great thank you so so I'm curious have you continued to hire staff during the last four months? 
We have. Um, so, so what we have done, so um, I would say right now in the facility I'm in right now, we have hired, uh, I want to maybe say around 30 additional associates, a uh, mix of full-time contractors. We've really been, um, you know, we've, we've really been trying to optimize the associate work based, um, you know, based on the demand, based on the skill set. So for example, you know, one of the negative consequences of COVID um, has obviously been, let's say, routine clinical diagnostic testing. So, you know, um, you know, you think about blood tests that many of us would have on an annual basis, you know, for, for your annual physical, you think about things like cervical cancer screening. A lot of, a lot of those types of tests have absolutely de declined in the industry. Um, you know, if we're in manufacturing facilities where those associates were making those types of tests, but there's also an opportunity to work on COVID supply and COVID, COVID manufacture. We've just repurposed those individuals where we've had to go to overtime or extended shift or where even with our existing associate base, um, you know, we've needed more resource than, than even overtime would cover. Uh, that's exactly where we've gone out and, and hired uh, associates. And, and again, We've been very fortunate here in the Baltimore area because, of course, you know, from an operations perspective, there are associates that were either furloughed or let go because of the core business they were in was just so negatively impacted because of the, the, the pandemic. But we were very fortunate to be able to pick those associates up and bring them into the into the BD family. So, so one of the questions was, um, are you having trouble finding qualified candidates? But it sounds like the answer to that is no. Uh, no, not, not really. I mean, again, it's, um, you know, for, for, the, for, the, for the, what we, you know, BD has a job grade structure. Um, I, th I think, you know, for the job grades that are going into R&D, particularly going into, into operations, every indication that I'm seeing right now is that we're doing, we're doing great. So um, another question here, uh, in in light of the rapidly changing landscape in terms of R and D and manufacturing, has there been a, any alteration in your patent strategy for COVID nineteen related products? Oh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's um, so. I mean, I, I wouldn't say we've altered the strategy. You know, it definitely becomes a little bit more sort of risk based, right? Because because I think obviously normal if you think about a diagnostic test or something like that, that takes two to three years, you know, you may well be in an environment where as you develop the test, you know, you're discovering intellectual property, you're maybe filing in, you know, um, uh, uh, invention disclosures and things like that. Um, and then you wait for those to be approved. And sometimes they're normally approvable or approved before you actually release the, the product. So, you know, what I would say is we're still discovering, um, you know, uh, uh, IP. We're still filing IDRs, you know, but we're not waiting for the reviews or the approval of any of those that were related to COVID to prohibit COVID-related solutions coming to market. Uh, so it looks like we might have a few people that are that are watching this morning that um, might be looking for positions at Beck to Dickinson. Because one of the questions I have here are what what positions are open now and what sort of qualifications. And if you'd like, uh, if you want to direct people to a website or to you know some 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 place where they can go and look that up. Yeah, that um, I mean, well, well, I'll I'll do two things, Marty. Maybe is. Um, I, I mean, for anything that is open anywhere in the BD network, uh, BD, you know, BD, BD.com um, is the public web, website where, you know, most um, vacancies will be posted. I know we also have some more local search engines like Monster and things like that. But what I'll, what I'll do is I'll take an action to look at, uh, for, at least for the Baltimore community or the Maryland community, um, you know, what would be the, the most common two or three website links. And if you're okay, I'll send those to you. And then if you could then distribute them out to the people that are registered and asking the questions, that it, that's probably the best way to do it. Otherwise, sure. BD.com. Otherwise BD sure. Now, we, we'd, we'd be happy to disseminate that information. That, that, that would be great. That's great. 
so, uh, so, so I have a question coming, coming back to, to antibodies and the presence of antibodies. Do you have an, an idea about the latest available data on how long antibodies are present after infection? Yeah, so um, again, great question. And, and what I would say right now is, I mean, I, I think we're learning every day. Um, so, you know, certainly based on what I know, and, and, and obviously my opinion and based on the literature that I am reading, um, you know, I think there are two, two factors that are, are emerging. Obviously, the antibody test itself really looks at two specific proteins. It looks at something called immunoglobulin M and immunoglobulin G, IgM and IgG. Uh, we know IgM rises very fast, but then declines quickly. Uh, if people have had sort of been exposed or, or, or had the infection and then IgG stays longer. So there's certainly there is a uh, IgG stays higher or elevated longer. Um, there is certainly a, a hypothesis right now that would say, you know, if you're able to measure IgG, then you're going to pick up as you look at epidemiology, as you look at, you know, screening the population, you know, being able to measure IgG appropriately is key. Um, there is also evidence that would say the level of the level of uh, antibody titer or the, 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 the however high the antibody is, has correlated with the severity of the actual disease itself. And then I would say in terms of how long those antibodies stay, I, and this will be very relevant to sort of obviously how we think about vaccine administration. I think right now the literature is sort of suggesting five to six months. Um, but, you know, but honestly, we continue to learn these data sets because, of course, until it really happened, the longitudinal studies to give us the real data insight, they're still underway. So I, I would say the most recent literature, I think, was around five months. Great. Thank you. So I, I know you have a hard stop at the top of the hour. Uh, yes. One more question, and then, then I'm, I'm going to have to cut it off, just so you, so you know, Dave, this tremendous interest, because a lot of questions have been coming in. Yeah. Um, but, but this question is, about, is really about data management and data sharing. And the, and the question is, you know, at, as the COVID-19 pandemic has, has hit, there's been a lot of data sharing, uh, a lot of collaboration and a lot of data sharing. Um, how have you dealt with concerns or have you had concerns about safeguarding proprietary information while at the same time you've been sharing data to be a part of this massive collaboration? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, so, so what I would say is that, that there are several levers. So, so first of all, um, you know, so, so BD itself has got um, what we call several informatics platforms. So yes, we have all these instruments that produce the test results. Um, and then those instruments themselves connect to, they'll either connect directly to a lab information system, you know, in a pathology lab or whatever, LIS, or we have our own informatics platform that may also aggregate and, um, you know, uh, sort of contribute towards data surveillance. Um, so I think, first of all, just in terms of our own development architecture for any software platform that we have, you know, we absolutely comply you know, in terms of de-identified data, cybersecurity, you know, our, our products are uh, um, tested for cybersecurity requirements, HIPAA, et cetera, et cetera. And then what we basically do is we, we feed bigger enterprise systems. So we will, either, we will either feed our data into a lab information system, a hospital information system, or an electronic medical record. And of course, you know, that's where the real degrees of rigor um, are um, are enforced. You know, one of the things that got released just last uh, week, last Friday, in fact, by the Department of HHS um, was new re new reporting requirements, so that the the nation can track the epidemiology by state here. And and obviously, you know, the states have really been given the mandate to reopen. There's a set of a clear set of 24 data requirements now that you know software companies informatic companies need to comply with so we're making sure that as we sort of continue to sort of do software development and that we either connect to these emrs or his systems that we're able to sort of uh, facilitate the collection in the right and appropriate manner for those 24 data points 
Great. Dave, thank you. Absolutely. So, so Dave, if it's okay with you, um, there are still a, a few unanswered questions, and I, and, and I, I hate to leave them unanswered. Mm -hmm. if, if we capture them and send them to you, um, could you take a look at them, answer them, and then we could dis dis distribute the answers to the audience? Absolutely. Yeah, please. I mean, Marty will be, I mean, just, you know, I mean, to those that have asked questions already, thank you so much. Um, and to those that I, we couldn't get to, my apologies, I do have a hard stop at 10. Um, but yeah, Marty, absolutely. If you can do those, get those off into an email to me, I will absolutely respond as soon as I can. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dave, I know you've been really busy with the worldwide response to COVID-19 and the pandemic. I really appreciate your time this morning. Um, this has been fantastic. I've really enjoyed it. Yeah, and Marty, to you and the team and, and, and the Tech Council, thank you for everything that you do, and it's great to engage. Thank you so much. Great. Bye, everybody. And I just want to remind everybody, our, our sponsor this morning is the University of Maryland Biopark. They're doing amazing things at the Biopark. So, uh, again, go to their website and take a look. And at the Tech Council, we thank you for your participation this morning. Um, we really appreciate the fact that you joined us. If you're a member of the Tech Council, thank you so much for your support. If you're not, go to our website at mdtechcouncil.com, take a look and consider becoming a member. Thank you so much for your time and happy Juneteenth. Thank you.